Sorghum and Steel, from Chuang No. 1, Part 4, Ruination, Class Critique in the Cultural Revolution. But this doubly divided class structure was not immediately apparent to those placed within it. Instead, the official class designations of the pre-revolutionary era were the primary means by which class was conceived in both the Hundred Flowers Movement and in the early portion of the Cultural Revolution. This is not surprising, given the category's persistent relevance for one's placement within the privileged hierarchy. But as a cultural revolution continued, this definition of class would be challenged, modified, and overturned by new, competing understandings of the roots of the developmental regime's crisis. Ultimately, China would see the gestation of a dispersed and inchoate ultra-left faction, Jizhao Pai, which would begin to articulate class in terms of the power structures actually in place under socialism. Though it developed rapidly, this faction was targeted by the state and dismantled through military suppression, mass imprisonment, and rustification before it could cohere. Early on, the predominant understanding of class was deeply conservative. The first to respond to the party's call to rebel were the relatively well-off children of the political elites, concentrated in the country's top universities. These students did not intuitively sense the true structure of the class system atop which they sat, and they had very little contact with the country's peasant majority. Class was therefore understood in a fashion consistent with official administrative categories. They came from good class backgrounds, as a children of cadre, revolutionary soldiers, or martyrs. While their surroundings were littered with people of bad class background, those who had been petty shopkeepers, workshop owners, or capitalists prior to 1949, as well as those who had been designated rightists, bad elements, or counter-revolutionaries during various rectification campaigns. Just like the privileged students of red lineage partook in their parents' glory, so too did the children of these black, i.e. bad class background, families partake in their parents' shame. Here, the prevailing interpretation of the issue of class came in the form of the bloodline theory, in which class was understood to designate a caste-like lineage inherited from the revolutionary period. These first months of the Cultural Revolution, from summer into the fall of 1966, were largely confined to Beijing, a city in which the bloodline theory was easily matched with an urban geography conducive to its growth. The city was largely an administrative center, with a heavy concentration of party officials and top universities. Even prior to the revolution, it had not been an industrial center, populated instead by an amorphous aggregation of petty traders, artisans, hired laborers, monks, and nuns, fortune tellers, traditional performers, and government clerks, as well as members of liberal professions such as teachers and doctors. After the revolution, when the city found itself split between state officials and various denizens of non-red class backgrounds, with a very small population of workers compared to other Chinese cities, and an even smaller cohort of students from peasant families. This created a situation in which Beijing students were divided between a minority from cadre and military families, and a majority from various non-red categories of urbanites, as well as those from black households. In this atmosphere, the earliest Red Guard group formed in Tsinghua University's attached middle school, grades 7-12, through 12, primarily defended the party's own class-line policy, criticizing and attacking students and teachers of non-red background. Membership in these Red Guard groups was tightly restricted, and Beijing's demography ensured that only around 15-20% to 20 of the middle school students were eligible. These conservative factions were also notoriously brutal, conducting home raids, setting up makeshift jails in which they beat and interrogated those of black class background, and requiring students of politically impure lineage to enter the classroom only through the back entrance. There were even demands made in big character posters calling for hospitals to stop blood transfusions from those of red lineage to those of non-red families, and to entirely ban donations from individuals of bad lineage. Across the city, those of bad class background were refused service at restaurants, on buses, and at hospitals. Warnings were given declaring Beijing as a revolutionary capital, off limits to those from black families, and the conservative Red Guard factions facilitated mass deportations. Between late August and mid-September 1966, 
As many as 77,000 were banished from Beijing to the remote countryside. Nearly half, about 30,000, of those banished were simply the dependents of those who held a bad class status prior to the revolution. Meanwhile, scattered killings of black categories occurred daily. The conservative till of the Cultural Revolution's early months, however, would soon see a backlash, as students of non-red backgrounds organized for their own defense. Bolstered by the call to attack the bourgeois reactionary line within the party itself, those left out of the privileged circles of the early Red Guards were now emboldened to attack party cadre directly and to oppose the conservative students who defended them. These attacks quickly scaled up with the abrupt downfall of many high-level cadres as capitalist rotors. Those born Reds who had once enjoyed power and privilege found themselves plunging to the status of bastards overnight. But this still did not provide a climate in which truly alternative views of class could take hold. Now, instead of bloodline, the focus was on capitalist rotors within the party, who were nonetheless portrayed as conspiratorial capitalists, KMT agents, or counter-revolutionaries. These outlandish categories were even applied to disgraced top officials, such as Louis Shaoqi and eventually Lin Biao. Class, then, was still tied strongly to pre-revolutionary class status, only now converted into a conspiracy theory whereby past power holders had secretly infiltrated the party all the way to the top and had only to be rooted out by the masses. After the capitalist rotors were ousted, the party itself would regain its purity. Later, this position would be slightly modified by Mao's faction within the party, which would oscillate between upholding the conspiracy theory version of class and a conception that acknowledged that the socialist developmental drive itself was capable of producing new capitalist rotors who are not agents of the old bourgeoisie. Nonetheless, the solution in either case remained the same, sift the good from the bad in order to revive the popular mandate of the party. It was not until late 1966 and early 1967 that more radical views of class began to be formulated, as the Cultural Revolution spread from Beijing to other Chinese cities where factional battles between students would be replaced with more widespread social mobilization across both privileged and deprived segments of the urban populace. The first peak of this general mobilization came in Shanghai in the winter of 1966 and 1967. This process of radicalization would later be referred to as a January storm, capped by the formation of the Shanghai Commune in early February. But, despite the radical name, the Shanghai Commune was actually the first in a series of defeats that would ultimately lead to the foreclosure of the potentials unleashed in the early years of the Cultural Revolution. Of all Chinese cities, Shanghai had been a hotbed of unrest during much of socialist history. Utterly unlike Beijing, it was populated by an enormous working class, many of whom had experienced a strike wave a decade earlier. But unlike the 1950s, when senior workers had spearheaded the suppression of strikes by a minority of temporaries and youth, Shanghai now found a much larger portion of its workforce in even more precarious positions. It is estimated that, by the mid-1960s, temporaries and worker peasants comprise as much as 3-40% to 40 of Shanghai's non-agricultural workforce. A large portion of these temporaries were women, as the system channeled women into low-paying and less secure jobs in small-sized neighborhood workshops, retail shops, and temporary labor teams, with some 100,000 women employed in such occupations by 1964. Meanwhile, wages had continued to stagnate and non-wage benefits were constrained as investments shifted away from the first front of the coastal cities and into the third front of the western provinces. More importantly, the post-GLF retrenchment policies had seen millions deported to the countryside in rustification programs. In Shanghai alone, the industrial workforce was downsized by about 15-20%. to 20%. Over 300,000 workers between 1961 and 1963. About 200,000 of these workers were relocated to rural areas and thereby lost their precious urban residential status. Despite their support for the state in 1957, many of those caught in this mass layoff were veteran workers since their upkeep was more expensive. When investment expanded again in the mid-1960s, a pool of rusticates was also resettled in the rural suburbs to be rehired as temporary laborers, retaining their rural hukou. This effectively recreated the explosive urban situation that had existed in 1957, but at a much greater scale. 
Not only did temporary workers begin to slow down production in late 1966, but when layoffs ensued, they began to form their own independent organizations. By November of 1966, the first major organization of temporary workers had been formed, called the Rebel Headquarters of Red Workers. Unlike the Beijing student groups, this was not a small faction organized around one or two institutions, but a massive umbrella network that soon became the largest rebel groups in the city, boasting over 400,000 members. Nor was the trend limited to Shanghai. In the same month, temporaries from all over the country formed the All-China Red Laborer Rebels Headquarters, and the group rapidly expanded, establishing branches in more than a dozen provinces and staging sit-ins at ACFTU and Ministry of Labor Headquarters. Combined with the agitation of the temporaries, the rusticates, particularly rusticated youth, began to return to the cities from which they had been deported, demanding reinstatement of their jobs and urban hukou status. The rusticates also formed their own independent groups, the largest of which was the rebel headquarters of Shanghai workers supporting agriculture, with some 100,000 members and sympathizers. The total number of rebel groups in Shanghai skyrocketed to over 5,300. Municipal authorities soon caved to workers' demands. The result was that factories revisited, albeit with far more violence, the pattern found in the GLF. When party committees flung open the factory doors to outsiders and provided full-time status to scores of new workers. Meanwhile, planning structures were again simplified and further decentralized, with functional departments being replaced by groups with broad powers over labor, finance, planning, and other issues. Centrally administered enterprises decreased from roughly 10,500 in 1965 to only 142. This gave enterprises and municipal authorities the power to grant wide-ranging back wage and bonus payments, as well as to transfer temporaries to permanent status. Factional fighting between workers also increased. The most visible of these conflicts was that between the Scarlet Guards, made up of skilled workers, party activists, and low-level cadres, and which had once enjoyed the support of the municipal leadership, and the Workers' General Headquarters, WGHQ, an umbrella organization of several other major workers' organizations. The Scarlet Guards were defeated by the WGHQ, and the railway linking Shanghai with Beijing was severed. Meanwhile, production declined precipitously, and the city's economy was practically paralyzed because numerous workers walked away from their posts. In the city, supply shortages would see shops looted and a run on the banks, as people feared for the safety of their savings. As this economic and political paralysis spread, a window was opened in which workers were able to take direct, if initially chaotic, control over production and day-to-day -day life. This process was facilitated by the structures established in their new organizations, which at this point were still independent of the party. But in Shanghai, this phenomenon would be short-lived. The proclamation of the Shanghai Commune represented the party's ability to divide and conquer these new workers' groups. Power seizure took on a contradictory character of central state efforts to restore order when local authorities had collapsed and workers' demands became excessive and economistic. State agents intervened in the name of the very workers who had disrupted order in the first place, portraying such interventions as if it were a product of the workers' own activity. The first stage of this restoration in late January would see the PLA called in to take control of communication and transportation facilities, supervise political stabilization and economic production, and conduct ideological education. In effect, the military was seizing key infrastructure nodes to prevent them from falling to rebel hands, all framed in the language of supporting the left. Meanwhile, this placed the military in alert positions within the urban fabric, readying them to suppress any more dangerous opposition that might arise despite the party's call for order. It was at this point that the party endorsed the formation of the Shanghai People's Commune, ostensibly a democratic federation of workers' groups that would take on the general administration of the city. In the creation of this new apparatus, the party explicitly invoked the language of the Paris Commune, even while ensuring that actual control was transferred to the occupying PLA. At the time of its inauguration, reportedly half the city's rebels stood defiantly outside the Shanghai Commune, which had been yoked together under the leadership of party representatives 
in which had only a selective federation of Shanghai's mass groups incorporated as its backbone. Among its first declarations was an ordinance that mobilized the military and police to seek out those who would undermine the Great Cultural Revolution, the Shanghai People's Commune, and the socialist economy, and to resolutely suppress them. Soon, even this commune was seen as excessive, and Mao recommended it be replaced by something along the lines of the Triple Alliances, initiated in northern China. This became the base of the new three-in-one revolutionary committees, run by military officers, party cadres, and representatives from pre-selected rebel organizations. These committees, increasingly dominated by the military, were to become the main model for constituting the new organ of power and rebuilding the political order. Those regions not yet deemed suitable for such alliances were instead placed under de facto military government. By March of 1967, nearly 7,000 agencies nationwide were under military control, including 10 of the 29 provinces. This began the outright militarization of Chinese politics, which would be a persistent feature of industrial organization throughout the rest of the socialist era. It would be wrong, however, to understand this military intervention as a widespread and violent suppression of a politicized population demanding more participatory forms of government. In fact, the vast majority of the rebels held unclear or contradictory political positions, if any. They were just rebels, not revolutionaries. There was little to idealize in most of these groups. Quote, they hardly ever thought about structural ways to overcome social maladies that had existed in the pre-CR China. They never questioned whether an old power structure with new power holders would be able to make any fundamental changes, and they had no idea about what they would do with their power. Instead, they were interested in power for the sake of power. End quote. The socialist developmental regime, put under severe strain, began to lose control. Rather than an ossifying bureaucracy, the revival of imperial forms of rule, or the transition to capitalism, the risk now was complete political fragmentation, a recurrent tendency in the history of mainland East Asia. The party responded to this threat by deploying the military at a scale not seen since the end of the revolution, effectively forcing the developmental regime back into order. Rustic kits were returned to the countryside, organizations of temporary workers were outlawed, and their leaders were arrested, and most importantly, independent organizations were largely prevented from spreading into rural areas. The New Trends of Thought Despite the simple power politics undergirding much of the rebels' activity, there also arose so-called new trends of thought, some of which are more coherently communist in nature. These new trends began to reconceive the concept of class under socialism and make tentative proposals for the restructuring of society. When suppressed, many of these trends took up the derogatory label ultra-left, leveled at them by their opponents. Signs of this trend were visible as early as the winter of 1966 and 1967 in Beijing as Yu Lu Ke, a temporary worker of bad class background, helped found a newspaper publishing articles in which he opposed a the bloodline theory and the excesses of the conservative Red Guard groups. Yu was ultimately imprisoned and executed, but his sympathizers would soon form the April 3rd faction, which published the article on the new trends of thought identifying the nation tendency. The April 3rd faction was publishing at a time when the country was pockmarked by armed conflict between rebel factions. In July 1967, the Wuhan incident would see local PLA division commander Chen Zidao back a conservative rebel faction in its attack against an opposing faction staffed by students and unskilled workers. Chen's troops laid siege to the city of Wuhan, refusing orders and ultimately taking high-ranking officials hostage. A thousand people were killed in the chaos, before Beijing sent in several other military divisions to suppress the mutiny. Nationally, the result was that many rebels were convinced of the need to attack the handful of capitalist rotors within the army. And between late July and early August, mass organizations raided army depots and barracks, and even attacked trains carrying war material to Vietnam. But other rebels used this as an opportunity to step back and analyze the situation. Armed conflicts began to subside as the military secured its hold and the new organs of power were established. In many cities, rebel leaders were variously scrambling for seats in the forthcoming revolutionary committees, often selling out their own constituencies in order to do so. 
This phenomenon convinced many within the nation ultra left that the committees were a sham, disguising the exercise of power by a new bureaucratic class that had been generated by the social system itself, as cadres and technicians took de facto ownership over the collective property of the people. This new conception of class led groups such as the April 3rd faction to argue that the goal of the Cultural Revolution was therefore to redistribute property and power and to destroy the foundation of the new privileged class. In this lull, various cities saw the formation of new trends of thought study groups and journals. Though the distribution of the materials was relatively limited, and many such groups were quickly suppressed. The very condemnation of these groups often had the unintended effect of giving them national attention and spreading their literature further afield. New trend groups could soon be found in Wuhan, Changsha, Guangzhou, Beijing, and elsewhere. The core themes for all such groups were the notion that a new privileged class had emerged in the form of state bureaucrats, that this ruling class exploited the people of China, especially the peasants, and that only a revolutionary civil war that overturned this new class could result in a communist society. Beyond this, however, the groups differed widely in the details. Most remained small, and they held divergent ideas, if any, about the revolution's immediate path forward. Many advocated the formation of a new, truly communist party, but where and how this might be done was left unclear. Similarly, the new trends of thought held a variety of positions, and often changed them, on what their relationship would be toward new organs of power, such as the revolutionary committees. Most of the groups advocated the People's Commune as an alternative political model, but again, the concrete structure of such communes was proposed only in vague terms that differ from group to group. The Paris Commune became their model simply because it was the only model they knew that was close to their ideal. This meant that, despite the concrete historical reference, they never asked themselves how the Paris Commune had actually functioned, and no one ever bothered to elaborate exactly what the future People's Commune of China would look like. Many scholars portray the new trends as little more than small intellectual groups with little experience in life, propounding an egalitarian utopianism that was severed from any true organizational practice. But this tends to emphasize the importance of individual theorists over the dynamic that produced them. Yang Shiguan, author of Wither China and one of the best-known thinkers of this camp, proposed instead that the function of the new network of study societies would both be to constitute the organizational form of grassroots social and political rebuilding and to facilitate the self-education of the youth, who had to discover the national basis for their hitherto largely instinctive revolt. Accordingly, their organizations had to become the center of systematic investigation and study. This hints at an awareness that history is primary to theory, with Yang and those like him, but the self-aware outgrowth of the mass struggle surrounding them. The risk of the party was that the self-awareness might spread to the rest of the proletarian segments of which Yang and others like him were a part. In parts of China, the nation altar left appeared to gain a more widespread purchase among organizations of temporary workers and rusticates as the latter ran up against the material limits identified in the altar left's writings. These organizations found themselves excluded due to their economism from the new revolutionary committees and then outlawed and attacked by the PLA. The trend was strongest in Changsha, where a small ultra-left group existed under the auspices of the Shang Wulian, an acronym for the Henan Provincial Proletarian Great Alliance Committee, a loosely structured coalition of rebel organizations, including several large groups with broad support in small factories and cooperatives. Among its most active members were tens of thousands of rusticated youth, as well as disaffected PLA veterans, formerly of the Red Flag Army, which held 90 columns of reportedly 470,000. In addition, other members of the Xi'an River Storm Coalition joined the Shang Wulians, including Alliance's apprentices, temporaries, workers in the light industrial and transportation sector, and groups of students and teachers. The Rusticates, as the most mobile segment of the rebel forces, also held the greatest potential to spread information and link up multiple local struggles. Rusticate's familiarity with both city and countryside also created the possibility that this new wave of more militant opposition might spread to the peasant majority. Rusticate's affiliated with ultra-left groups were documented traveling between Guangzhou, Changsha, and Wuhan, participating in various activities in each city, and sharing experiences. In late 1967, 
delegates from a dozen provinces gathered in Changsha to discuss matters of pressing concern. In Wuhan, Lu Lian, of a new trans group called the Plow Society, theorized that a new upsurge of the peasant movement would come in the winter of 1967 and 1968, and the Plow Society attempted to link up with peasant groups in the surrounding countryside. Similarly, the Shang Wulian attempted to send investigation teams out into rural areas in the style of the early CCP. Suppression, Concessions, and Terror In the end, these more active ultra-left currents were crushed, along with the others. Among the main reasons for their failure to spread were military suppression and conservative terror. Over the course of 1967 and 1968, one of the most extensive campaigns of violent repression carried out since the end of the Revolutionary War tore across the country as the PLA stifled factional strife and established revolutionary committees in each of China's provinces. This was followed between 1968 and 1972 by several more campaigns, this time carried out by the committees themselves, representing conservative rebel groups and privileged sections of the population, with the aim to purge the class enemies who purportedly had instigated factional strife. Despite the common portrayal of the Cultural Revolution as 10 years of chaos, in which factions of every persuasion clash violently on the streets, bringing the country to the brink of civil war, there is now good evidence that the vast majority of violence in the era was performed by conservative rebel groups and by the revolutionary committees, dominated by the PLA. The timing of the spikes in violence in each province followed the establishment of these committees, beginning in the cities and ultimately spreading to the countryside, in a wide-ranging campaign of state terror. Quote, Only 20-25% to 25% of those who were killed or permanently injured or who suffered from political persecution during the Cultural Revolution met with such misfortune before the establishment of their county revolutionary committee. This means that the vast majority of casualties were not the result of rampaging Red Guards or even armed combat between mass organizations competing for power. Instead, they appear to have been the result of organized action by new organs of political and military power, as they consolidated and exercised their power, often in very remote regions, they carried out massacres of innocent civilians, crushed organized opposition, and conducted mass campaigns to ferret out traitors that routinely relied on interrogation through torture and summary execution, end quote. Of those 20 to 25 percent who were killed or attacked prior to the establishment of the Revolutionary Committees, there were doubtless victims of factional fighting and other conflicts, but many were also those of black family backgrounds targeted by conservative rebels in the early months of the Cultural Revolution. There was a rough continuity between the latter and the more wide-ranging state-led terror that would follow, since many of the outlawed rebel groups were precisely the economistic organizations of proto-proletarian temporaries rusticates, apprentices, and worker peasants. Among these, it was new trends groups who were recognized as the greatest threat, despite their smaller size. Significant resources were poured first into propaganda decrying their positions as anarchism and economism, and then into the systematic rounding up of all those even distantly affiliated with such groups for interrogation, imprisonment, and execution. This correlation between spikes of repressive violence and the founding of new organs of state power, staffed by cadres, military officials, and representatives of the more privileged urban workers, signals that much of the violence that was unleashed during the Cultural Revolution might be better understood as a sort of white terror disguised in red garb, geared toward the suppression of any communist potential latent in the activity of the largely proto-proletarian rebels. The spread of this violence from city to countryside, despite there being such a small density of rural rebel groups, Hints of this white terror was also a response to the risk that the conflagration might spread from the urban proto-proletariat, especially rusticates, to the country's peasant majority. Nonetheless, the failure of the new trends in the Cultural Revolution cannot be attributed to the terror alone. Structural factors tilted the odds against them, especially the enterprise and collective unit atomization of Chinese society, including restraints on mobility. Only rustic kits and worker peasants truly moved back and forth between the rural and urban zones, and even they often stayed well within the range of the city. Most of the country's workers and peasants rarely left their county or city, and even urban workers had most of their basic needs fulfilled within the enterprise itself. 
autarky ensured that the ties between regions, enterprises, and privileged strata were weak. When interregional ties began to form as rebel groups sought to link up, they were often starting from scratch. Maybe more importantly, the privileged structure of the social state was not in a terminal crisis. Many of the privileges associated with working in a state-owned heavy industry would be retained in some form for another 30 years, with mass layoffs in the country's state-owned enterprises not beginning until the 1990s. Though the number of proto-proletarian workers increased in the 1960s, it was not increasing evenly across the country, nor had it grown to incorporate anything close to the majority of the population. Though the number fluctuated, in 1981, after the reform era had begun, and more than a decade since the short cultural revolution, some 42% of all industrial workers were still employed in state-owned enterprises, producing 75% of the country's gross value of industrial output. At the time of the Cultural Revolution, the proto-proletariat was largest in the coastal port cities of the South, with their base of light industry, as well as in certain interior river port cities such as Wuhan and Changsha. It was smallest in the Northeast, in cities such as Harbin and Shenyang, where heavy industries were still dominant. Those in this proto-proletariat were mostly women, young workers, and off-season peasants. This meant that the region's long tradition of patriarchy, the social seniority wage structure, and the grain divide had already ensured that any battle against marginalization would be fought on uneven ground, with the proto-proletariat forced to combat not only the party in the military, but also a large segment of the generation that had fought and won the war for liberation. In other words, the basic problem faced by the rebels was that the party was able to retain a significant enough legitimacy among the general populace that challenges to it were also challenges to a large section of the working class, who enjoyed a combination of concrete and ideological benefits under the existing regime. The party state was not an alien force weighing down on an unwilling population. It was an extensive, clientelist structure based on vertical networks of loyalty, which were marked publicly on a regular basis and reproduced by active cooperation on the part of many workers. Given the ideological authority and the real power wielded by older, especially male workers, the marginalized would find it difficult to fully legitimize what were effectively preparations for a new civil war to be fought against the victor to the last. The long cultural revolution would see the violent securing of new organs of power combined with widespread concessions to this loyal segment of the population. Another burst of industrialization came in the new leap forward of 1970. Newly militarized industries underwent expansion, planning was again decentralized, and more investment was funneled into the countryside, resulting in a complete recovery of production from the lows of the short cultural revolution. The next years would see a moderation of these policies, but there was always an emphasis on retaining the support of loyal segments of the population, despite austerity. One of these most important concessions was the massive extension of basic education, especially to rural children. The rapid expansion of basic education during the Cultural Revolution decade allowed, for the first time, the great majority of Chinese children to complete primary school and attend middle school. Similar concessions were made in healthcare and in party, military, and factory recruitment practices. At the same time, the country's high-end universities were effectively shut down, and the privileged children of both red and expert elites were sent to farms and factories to participate in manual labor. Though these reforms are firmly planted in the conservative framework of attacking individual capitalist rotors within the party, they were nonetheless highly visible attempts at reform that brought non-negligible benefits to many people, especially the peasant majority, who could now hope for at least some chance of upward mobility for their children via education. In the factories, attempts were made to curtail the corruption of local officials, and renewed emphasis was placed on participatory decision-making. This limited the authority of engineers and cadre, but ultimately resulted in the reconcentration of power in the hands of supervisors, work team leaders, and activists, all of whom controlled key links of official patronage via the factory's party committee. Similarly, the limits placed on material incentives and technical or managerial pay grades did not result in a flattened wage hierarchy so much as a return to the seniority system that resulted from the wage reform over a decade earlier, benefiting senior workers at the expense of technicians, cadre, temporaries, and apprentices.
such concrete gains are paired with widely publicized promotions and demotions that help to mythologize the era's progressive character. The benefits of the party elite were curtailed, and the party itself was restructured as a handful of peasants and women were rapidly promoted to relatively high positions. Among the most notable of these was Chen Yonggui, an illiterate peasant who had risen from village head to member of the Politburo, and ultimately vice premier, largely due to the model status accorded his native village of Da Chai. Chen's promotion was designed to create a sort of Obama effect, tokenizing a model peasant from a model village in order to produce the illusion of general social mobility, while in reality, the rural-urban divide had deepened. Similarly, Zhang Qing, Mao's wife, became a full member of the Politburo in 1969, one of only a small handful of women ever to do so. Acting as one of the Gang of Four, she briefly secured a position as one of the most powerful figures in Chinese politics. Again, the token prominence of a strong female leader helped to obscure intractable gender divisions among the workforce and distract from the continued suppression of more radical organizations formed by proto-proletarian workers, the majority of whom are women. Together with more concrete benefits, this widely advertised restructuring the party would help to secure support from a wide enough segment of the population to make the outbreak of a new civil war unlikely. The Limits of Heresy Aside from this, there is also the simple problem of inexperience among those groups advocating such a violent confrontation. The ultra-leftist very decision to operate as above-ground organizations, publicly publishing opposition journals, signals a certain political naivete. Though they did often keep authorship secret, there is no evidence that the new trans groups ever considered founding any sort of clandestine organization despite the fact that they upheld the activity of the early CCP, itself founded in secrecy as a model. In part, this can be attributed to the chaotic political terrain. But emphasizing the messiness of the situation defers the real root of the problem, which was not so much that the terrain was rapidly shifting, but that these ultra-left groups almost universally misperceived the possibilities offered to them and the necessities hemming them in. Simultaneous with the terror, China witnessed the explosion of an increasingly religious, state-sanctioned ideological fervor, paired with the militarization of production, the bolstering of party-state mythology played an important role in ordering the socialist developmental regime when it seemed to be coming unbound. Costly material incentives were replaced with spiritual rewards, such as pins or pictures with CCP iconography, quotation books, and mangoes. Such spiritual rewards symbolized patronage by the party-state, while also building cultural and emotional ties that bound individuals to the enterprise or rural collective. New forms of meaning and social connection were developed, but they often took a paternalistic character that drew as much from pre-revolutionary folk traditions as from the Russian precedent. Just as many of the practices were entirely new, developed by accident, or grown somewhat organically from people's everyday experience, but only those that helped to bolster the stability of the socialist developmental regime were enshrined in the official religious complex facilitated by the party state. Constructing this ideology entailed the invention of rituals that reinforced a particular myth of unity between state, party, and nation, as well as the limiting of access to outside information and the selective rewriting of history to accommodate the myth's contemporary function. Pilgrimages to historical sites became common, as youth traveled the national rail networks to visit places like An Yuan, the communist first major base area. At the same time, these historical sites are ritualistically sanitized. In one telling instance, Red Guards pulled up a pair of gum trees that had stood in front of the original An Yuan Workers Club building, thinking, mistakenly, that the trees had been planted by Louis Shaoqi. Louis, whose personality cult had dissipated with his fall from grace, had been replaced by Mao at the apex of the ritual hierarchy. The roots of the trees are dug from the ground, chopped up and burnt to ashes to purify the site. Afterwards, cypress samplings collected from Chairman Mao's nearby birthplace of Shaoshan were transported to Anyuan, where they were solemnly transplanted in place of the uprooted gum trees. This new religious fervor was not purely a matter of reinforcing certain ideas over others. It also involved the material restriction of information by the party's censorship apparatus. This had effectively starved oppositional groups of theoretical resources and most importantly, 
accurate information about events around them, whether domestic or global. All of the ultra-left groups are therefore forced to form their theories and strategies based largely on reading works by Mao, Lenin, Engels, some Marx, and others still within the officially sanctioned canon, along with information from official newspapers. Such groups existed in an ideological climate where invocations of Mao Zedong thought had become a sort of lingua franca. Even the most radical tenets of the ultra-left were justified in terms of an oppositional Maoism, and their texts wound themselves in circles, attempting to sort out Mao's apparently contradictory words and actions. The reinvented Communist Party that would lead a new civil war against China's bureaucratic ruling class was to be, in the words of Yang Shi Guan, the party of Mao Zedongism and Mao himself was frequently envisioned as its chairman. This is despite the fact that the theorists, such as Yang, clearly recognized the mystifying effects of the religious fervor stoked by the state. He argued that the capitalist rotors had managed to deify Mao's brilliant ideas into some ritualistic entities. In doing so, they have also distorted and rendered impotent the revolutionary soul of Mao Zedongism. Rather than rejecting this mythology outright, however, Yang attempts to sift through it in the hope of discerning the rational kernel of Maoism hidden deep within the mysticism. Similarly, when attempting to spread their project to the peasantry, new trans groups ignored the pressing need for secrecy and tended to misperceive the nature of rural power divides. Compounding the problem was the fact that their own vision of what a communist countryside should look like was often unappealing to those who actually lived there. This led to a series of terminal missteps and a few rural campaigns that did get off the ground. In Wuhan, Lu Lian of the Plow Society built strong ties with the first headquarters of Bahe District of Sichui County, a peasant rebel group headed by Wang Renchao. Wang's own idea of a communist countryside was inspired by the collectivist utopias envisioned by the party's ideological apparatus during the height of the GLF. After traveling to see Wang's experiment in Bahe, Lu's own new trend circle also began to propagate this vision of a new communist countryside. Though Wang's argument that the peasantry was the most exploited class in socialist China was true to reality, his new countryside was hardly communist. Instead, it was an experiment modeled after military communism, centralizing resources at the commune level and engaging in unpopular practices such as tearing down the private residences and then requisitioning a family-owned livestock. Peasants were made to eat all meals together in collective mess halls, as during the GLF, and were required to live collectively in barrack-style housing. When the model met with strong resistance from a majority of the local residents, the rebel group established a militia, which was empowered to punish mercilessly anyone who dared to sabotage the new countryside. By siding with such forces, Lu Lian's plow society distanced itself from the peasants' real grievances instead bolstering a mystified vision in the countryside that was itself in large part a mere mimicry of the party's own ruling mythology. The new trends then can be understood as a sort of heretical current, in opposition to the ruling ideology, but still subsumed by the terms of that ideology itself. Unable to break beyond the bonds of the party state's own mythology, the ultra-left was incapable of perceiving any true path forward. It was thus unable to avoid its own destruction, and failed to ignite the potentials for a new communist project that had emerged out of the conflicts of the socialist era. The most severe of these missteps was the assumption that, in the last instance, Mao would be on their side. In reality, it was on Mao's own orders that the ultra-left was exterminated. Those who survived with their freedom fled in handfuls to neighboring countries in an attempt to transform a domestic revolutionary situation into wars abroad. The rest were imprisoned or otherwise lost to the terror. Finally, though we must foreground the present relevance of this historical sequence, it is only fair to note that the short cultural revolution bears also the inherent value of all the tragedies and lost causes that cut their shadows against the fading light of history. Communists today at least owe the respect of acknowledging that this was a period in which communist partisans, however dispersed, disorganized, and disoriented, did in fact fight and fail. These were people of our own hearts who were killed, imprisoned, or worst of all, were formed by the grim vectors of the hollowed world that we inherited. In the end, we can at least lay flowers on the graves of the dead, since their enemies are our own. Conclusion Unbinding The year 1969 signified the unbinding of socialism in China. The system was held together for years more 
only by an extreme extension of the state in the form of the military into all fields of economic coordination, production, and distribution, and by a desperate amplification of the ruling ideology into all realms of life. When even these would no longer suffice, catastrophic collapse is avoided only by the tactful maneuvering of a now unified ruling class of red engineers, whose political dynasty continues to this day. Here we have emphasized the domestic scale of these phenomena, focusing on the slow knitting together of China as a coherent economic entity. This local focus makes sense, as a socialist era would see much of mainland East Asia pulled out of the global circuits of capital accumulation. China was a name for this retreat, an attempt at autonomy performed across a massive territory and staffed by an enormous segment of the global population. Interaction with the outside world via trade, migration, or cultural transmission slowed to a trickle, limited to meager contact with a specific subset of third world countries once Sino-Soviet relations broke down. This retreat ultimately failed, and the next 50 years will see the East Asian mainland and its people slowly reincorporated into the very circuits of value that they had wrested themselves from. But this is not to say that the socialist era did not have a global dimension. It was the largest in a worldwide wave of socialist revolutions, which were themselves merely the late peak of a workers' movement founded in Europe. Though their guiding mythology emerged from the industrial cores of the capitalist world, all of these revolutions were a product of a politicized peasantry, driven to fight against both old and new regimes. In China, the industrial mythology of the workers' movement would fuse with the reality of rural revolution in a more seamless fashion than it had in the Soviet Union. The product of a socialist culture in which Marxist eschatology merged with centuries of peasant millenarianism. This combination proved capable of igniting one of the largest developmental bursts in human history. The limits and incentives that confronted this project were also global in nature. As the Qing declined, the once powerful region was thrown into a century of violent disunity, just as a new empire was arising in Europe. In only a few generations, one of the richest parts of the world had suddenly become one of the poorest. This led to the invention of China as an ancient, unifying name for the region by Western-educated nationalists seeking a restoration of power relative to Europe and its satellites. Since the area's continuing poverty was in large part a product of Europe's own ascent, the revolutionary process would take on an anti-imperialist character. At the same time, the very threat of the European imperial projects set the standards for Chinese development. In this period, there could be no revival of the old peasant utopias, since these would entail developmental stagnation, ensuring that the region would be unable to resist the colonial ambitions of Europe and Japan. After the capitulation of the Qing and GMD to foreign powers, it became increasingly clear that the development of the region could not be achieved through an alliance between a new industrial bourgeoisie and the old elites, as had happened in late developing countries such as Germany. Instead, the old regime had to be entirely destroyed, alongside domestic capitalists dependent on port trade with the West. The fusion of peasant millenarianism with the teleology of the workers' movement seemed to offer an alternative model for development, but absent the normal agents of this development, the ascendant bourgeoisie, or an iron and rye alliance between new and old elites, the project could advance only via big push phases of industrialization. In capitalist countries, this type of industrialization was carried out at the extremes of global economic crisis, when the anchors of value production seemed to be tearing loose. In socialist countries, Development had to be undertaken as if the economy was perpetually in a state of crisis, because these systems existed without any such anchor. This meant that the socialist period in China also saw the developmental regime ultimately supplant the communist project itself, as more and more was sacrificed to the bottom line of building a national economy. This was a failure structured by the era. The mythology of the workers' movement helped to make this era possible, since it tended to conflate the expansion of production and industrial employment with the historical advancement of society toward communism in a teleological fashion. But of far more importance was the besieged and isolated condition in which this experiment took place. Beginning in such extreme poverty, it is hard to fault the early communists for emphasizing development. By the time a new generation attempted to expand this communist horizon, however, those early communists had become irreparably yoked to the machine of their faith. Space for this developmental project was opened only because of a global crisis in the capitalist economy.
from the 1910s until the end of the Korean War and the post-World War II recessions, the global economy seemed to be teetering on the edge of oblivion. This teetering took the form of a half-century of war, depression, and extreme unpredictability. The global economy fragmented as nations raised tariffs, emphasized closed-circuit domestic trade, and initiated nationwide industrialization projects, often with a strong military character. It was only in this context of a general global cloistering of production that the socialist projects could take place at such an enormous scale, ultimately covering most of the Eurasian continent. It is no coincidence that the two largest socialist revolutions took place roughly alongside the two world wars, since these wars represented two peaks in this cloistering. In the same way, the Chinese socialist project was capable of emerging only within the context of the global workers' movement in the period of industrial expansion that conditioned it. This general expansion of industry and manufacturing employment ensured that the Chinese inherited at least a rudimentary industrial structure in Manchuria, and that Western nations were still focused on domestic development rather than actively seeking overseas sites for production. There were few strong incentives to open China in this period, and to attempt to do so seemed merely a recipe for extending world war by another decade. The Cold War was a detente in which Chinese socialism was simply quarantined and allowed to run its course. All of these conditions would change beginning in the 1970s as a relative cloistering of the early 20th century gave way to a series of expansionary drives under a new global hegemon. At the same time, technological advances both decreased the need for expensive industrial workers and allowed for the extension of supply chains to far-flung regions of the world. Increased unemployment lowered wages and falling profits in the West, created a need for cheaper sources of production as deindustrialization generalized. Relocating factories to places like South Korea and Taiwan allowed firms to regain profitability while also offering cheaper prices for Western consumers, helping to mute the domestic effects of the economic slowdown. It was these change conditions that would soon encourage the opening of China but this opening would be accepted by the Chinese only due to the failures of the socialist developmental regime, and even then only slowly. Above, we have detailed the local history of the failure of the communist project in China. In the next issue of Chuang, we will return to the global integration that followed this failure, as China opened to world trade and initiated its transition to capitalism in the late 1970s.